Pavanji, a question comes to my mind with uh, regard to cyber crimes. Usually, these crimes would be, say, in relation to property or uh, in nature of loss of reputation, uh, sort of defamation, etc. Uh, could, in some instances, uh, these relate to crimes uh, against the body also? And of course, the crimes against the state can be committed, that is very much understood. But my question is, could this be by way of conspiracy or a single person relate to a crime against body? Sir, today the way things are evolving, cyber is becoming an integral part of almost every and any cyber crime or normal crime activity at large. So, let's take uh, the recent case of the Shraddha murder. Now, in that particular case, the physical murder has taken place by Aftab. Uh, 35 pieces of the body have been uh, created and thrown in different parts of the jungle. But ultimately for doing that, he's gone ahead and accessed the internet, trying to find out mechanisms of how he can uh, go and wipe his electronic evidences, his footprints, and also has been using the Instagram handle of the person well after she was murdered, so as to give a different set of impression to the entire world, apart from manipulating the use of communication devices and other electronic evidence. So cyber elements are now integral part of common actual day-to-day -day, uh, criminal activities. But when I look at the cyber law paradigm or cyber crime paradigm as a large, I can broadly see some broad categories emerging on cyber crime. Cyber crimes can either be against persons, when you target a particular person, which is in the form of cyber defamation, cyber nuisance, or cyber harassment, cyber stalking. It could be in the form of uh, cyber crimes against property, when you target a particular property, whether it's uh, computers, whether it's hacking, cracking, damage to computer source code, or cyber crimes could even be against nations. This could be in the form of uh, cyber terrorism, cyber war, cyber radicalization. And now this fourth category has emerged being uh, social media crimes, where you are only looking at criminal activities that are being done on social media. And the fifth uh, category of cyber crimes is now beginning to evolve with now new technological uh, paradigms evolving. These include artificial intelligence crimes, metaverse crimes, Internet of Things crimes and quantum computing crimes. So cyber is now here. It's like one color that's permeated all colors in the landscape. And you just cannot now run away from the cyber criminal aspect in any activity. Today, every criminal uses cyber as an integral component for his planning, for his execution and implementation of his criminal design. Therefore, the onus is going to be on law enforcement agencies on how they can go ahead and separate the cyber elements, the electronic evidence elements, whenever they are investigating any normal crime. And in case if they are only investigating a cyber crime, then deal with the relevant uh, electronic evidence, which is incriminating the said matter, pick it up and then not just retain it properly, but also prove it as admissible electronic evidence in courts of law. So cyber is everywhere. Cyber is not at all going anywhere. Uh, the question comes to my mind while designing a course on uh, cyber law. How much component of the entire course would relate to cyber crimes? Today, I see cyber law not as an independent uh, siloed uh, discipline as well. It's constantly evolving as a multidisciplinary uh, kind of an exercise. And therefore, whenever I talk of cyber law, it is evolving, it's constantly growing, it's going to have within its umbrella and not just cyber crime, but also cyber security and emerging technologies. So when you are a law teacher and you are going ahead and creating a curriculum on cyber law, so if the curriculum was to be of 100 units, then clearly I am going to mark only 60 units only for cyber legal uh, principles and jurisprudential concepts. I am going to mark another, uh, say, 15 uh, units only for cyber crime, because cyber crime is also contributing to cyber legal jurisprudence. I'm also going to uh, allocate another 15 units only to cyber security because cyber security is now a new discipline that is now being subject to regulation and therefore cyber security law is becoming a sub-discipline of cyber law as an umbrella. And the remaining uh, 10 uh, units, I'm going to focus only on emerging technologies, whether it's artificial intelligence, blockchain, internet of things, or even content computing and the connected legalities and also the connected criminal aspects that are evolving there under. Uh, what uh, books or what literature would you recommend for the faculty uh, which has been uh, assigned uh, the subject of cyber law and cyber crimes? 
Well, there are some books that are available. You can have a look at them. But uh, I've written more than 180 books, uh, which are 180 uh, books. 180 books in last 26 years. Uh, are you talking about articles or books? I'm talking about books, sir. Wow! I'd be surprised. Yes. I write uh, one hour every morning, and I do that last 26 years. And over a period of time, it helps you contribute in creating okay. some books. So a lot of my books are available on Amazon. You can have a look at them. But if you're looking at only cyber law, the cyber law 3.0, which is a very practical oriented stuff uh, that you can pick up. You can also pick up the textbook on cyber uh, cyber law, uh, which is there, and also the law on intermediaries because intermediaries are getting very very popular. You can other look at other uh, books of other foreign authors. But if you are in India, then please realize that you will have to have a customized Indian approach. And a lot of these foreign readings may be relevant in other jurisdictions. They not be may not be completely relevant in the Indian context. And therefore, I think it's not just books, but also constantly updating yourself via the internet. The latest developments uh, on uh, cyber legal issues could also be a good uh, kind of a knowledge source for your constantly enhancing knowledge on cyber law. Wonderful. And uh, now for the faculty as well as for the students uh, to sort of acquire a clinical approach. What uh, is uh, your advice, both for the faculty assigned to teach as well as the students, the clinical mode to grasp the nuances of uh, cyber law and cyber crimes? Well, if you're a faculty, then you need to plan your particular session or your course on cyber law in a very methodical, scientific and clinical manner. Number one, uh, please identify how many hours are you going to teach in that particular course. So maybe it could be 30 hours, it could be one credit course, it could be two credit course. Depending on how many hours that you have, please allocate the specific subjects that you are seeking to cover in the curriculum as different uh, hours to be covered in different I classes. would need to stop just quickly. Uh, while at this, do you recommend that this should be an elective course or a mandatory course for the say five year law degree? Sir, today uh, the time has now completely changed. Cyber law has to be a mandatory course. It cannot only be an elective course because everybody is using cyberspace. Whatever you do after law, everybody is using the digital format and they are going to ask you uh, questions. They are going to expect you to know about the legal principles pertaining to uh, cyberspace. So I uh, actually uh, recommend that uh, cyber law needs to be a mandatory course. I myself running about 37 courses on uh, a platform called cyberlawuniversity.com and these courses have already been done by more than 30,000 professionals from 174 countries uh, speaking 52 national languages. A lot of my courses are also on my Udemy. So you can pick up some of those courses. You can go and devise your own independent course. But uh, the elements of case studies will be an important component. Some of the existing case laws that have evolved would also be incorporated. Uh, please also incorporate a moot court as an integral part of your class. Uh, incorporate group discussions, allocate different hours, and also then ultimately give projects to your students. Uh, a big chunk of your class should also be giving them a specific research project. Let them research on elements in uh, cyberspace and come back to you and then present to the entire class. So that when you are, you are actually giving say 20 projects to the class, the class tends to get benefited by knowing about the nuances about 20 different aspects that are going to happen. So ultimately, please understand it's clay. You are the creator. You have to uh, create your own particular creation or a toy that you want to create. You are the master. Uh, please go ahead and unleash your creativity when you are structuring or delivering your cyber law courses. Uh, last question, uh, very quick. Uh, while teaching in the class, uh, particularly with regard to prosecution and law enforcement, what sort of evidence, whether direct, indirect, uh, whether documentary or otherwise expert evidence, what are the speciality of production of evidence, leading of evidence in a court of law for cyber crimes? Today, no cybercrime conviction can actually be achieved without proving the relevant incriminating electronic evidence. So if you are in a cybercrime matter, electronic evidence has to be your basic uh, ammunition that you'll have to fire. But how do you do that? You'll have to first identify what's the relevant incriminating electronic evidence. Then you'll have to see how it's potentially collected from the scene of crime or from the servers <coughs> of the service providers and intermediaries. Then how is that actually going to be protected and uh, retained? And finally, how is it actually going to be produced and proved as admissible electronic evidence in courts of law? Those are areas that you will have to specifically focus on. 
you will have to be mindful of the law laid down by the Supreme Court in the Constitution Bench judgment of Arjun Pandit Rao Khotkar versus Kailash Gorantiyal, where the law pertaining to electronic evidence has completely been redefined as uh, late as in July 2020. You'll have to ensure compliance with the mandatory requirements of Section 65B of the Evidence Act because the Supreme Court in Anwar P. V. versus P. K. Bashir has categorically held that Section 65B of the Evidence Act is a distinctive code in its own self and will have to be complied with whenever you are producing and proving any electronic evidence. So please incorporate all that elements as an integral part of your strategies as you go forward in the direction of uh, prosecution of cyber crimes. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Pavan Dugalji. I must say that uh, your presentation has been fascinating and that would greatly help, assist and guide, also motivate uh, the uh, emerging law faculty as well as the existing law faculty uh, about this new branch of law. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It's been a pleasure having uh, been with you on your show. Thank you, sir. Thank you.